All right, welcome everybody. Today we're talking about Lysistrata by Aristophanes. Um, assuming people might have seen a theatrical performance or maybe uh, of a comedy play or maybe read a book. Uh, so we kindly ask people if you can mute yourselves. Um, and then we're a very you know, tight knit group. So whenever you have a question, just unmute yourself, ask a question. Or if you're not comfortable, you can put it through chat. And then maybe somebody you know, could be a, um, a friend and read it uh, through the chat. And again, I'm, an, I'm no, uh, no sense of expert in literal pieces or history pieces, but um, I organized this meetup and therefore today um, we're gonna talk about this piece. So the first thing I wanna talk about is um, the, review of the reviews of the book. Um, there was you know, a couple that I found was interesting. Uh, there was James Wainley said the Lustrata had a innuendo and a fool on battle of sexes but strip it bare, you find an, a hard hitting political message about the pointless meaning of ongoing war against the Greek state. Uh, then there's also another one, Lestrade is worth to read, even if it's see the dynamics between men and women then, okay? So basically the critically acclaimed is an interesting book to read, interesting, you know, maybe there's a movie. In fact, I actually saw a movie in three languages, which is interesting. There's a, a Persian, uh, <laughs> version of it. There is a Russian version of it and there's an English version of it. Since I speak the three languages, I <laughs> saw it in three languages. Some, some, I mean, not for this preparation of this, but I saw it in three different languages. Anyway, so first I want to talk about the Aristophanes, right? So about the author. All right. So um, we're going to talk about him, uh, his bi biography, and then we're going to talk about his works, right? And then people can correct me if I'm wrong. So Aristophanes was born in Athens, you know, between 450 and 445. He was what I call an old com comedy um, enthusiast. Uh, there is a new comedy, it's old comedy, and basically a plot of the, um, um, you know, uh, the, of this comedy is particularly, you know, measured toward the old economy. economy. And as we go through it, I'll point what the differences are. Um, so basically, you know, um, he, al he always mocked political and social issues in Athens. Um, and he lived through Peloponnesian War, you know, uh, in the issues were against citywide women, you know, philosophers, any kind of issues you can think of. Um, you know, obviously he's a contributor to the Greek comedy. Uh, and most of his comedies kept pace with political climate of Athens. So all the comedies is about the current state of things. So at the time it was current state of things, uh, not necessarily how the, you know, uh, you know, mythical person would live, you know, uh, has all these riches, but how the people live on the current day-to-day -day, uh, lives. Um, so in the times of Athenian uh, plots, the pre-war conflict, he wrote his own conspiracies such as Lysistrata, right? Uh, this particularly fitting. With such a plot, the play was inevitably rude, but his sympathy for the difficulty of women in wartime makes the play moving comments on the foolishness of the war. Okay, and then we'll talk about symbolism of a lot of the things. I may not be diving in a lot of the text, but I'll do talk about symbolism of it. Let's continue with Aristotle. Oh, Aristophanes, sorry. Well, the city wise was, you know, in, between the mid war, Peloponnesian mid war, Aristophanes' comedy continued to be crisp. And cutting. However, in sphere of comedy, the cunning rudeness of the old economy disappeared and was replaced by a more cautious, refined, and less spirited new comedy. So this is a transition we're talking about right now. So we're more patient about well, Sparta coming into the uh, uh, sphere of influence. So he's, they're obviously less uh, inclined and you know more toward the uh, you know emitting and ostracizing a person from the society. Um, so he, he was diving into being more politically cautious. The political climate was uneasy with Spartan lodging over at Athens, where something had to hold his tongue and his plays no longer joking and leaders and politics, days of death range about 385, 380. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Peloponnesian War. And in this case, you know, um, you know, Peloponnesian War happened between 431 and 404 BCE. We all know about the golden age of Athens, Pericles, but you know, uh, not necessarily a mistake that he made. He kept people inside the wall, and uh, you know, obviously Spartans came up with a way of 
uh, using the um, you know sh you know proper uh, 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 you know ships, and therefore was able to beat Athens in their own uh, game uh, because Athens were the you know seafarers, and the uh, you know Spartans were mostly uh, um, you know uh, land force. So the uh, the leaders of the Athens decided to wage a war uh, from the sea only. Meanwhile, the Spartans burned the crops of Athens. Then plague, you know, hit the Athens and fought Turkey. The long war finally ended when the Athens surrendered in the spring of 404 BC because of starvation. So, I mean, it was a bad idea, obviously, keep the people inside and Pericles himself died as well. So, and um, I wanted to actually today show you a little bit of, you know, Athen wall, but I couldn't really find reincarnation of it. So, but I just wanted to point out, um, you know, uh, 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 obviously in the city of Athens, they have Acropolis, right? Acropolis, uh, that's where they kept all the treasury for the Athen League, right? You have Peloponnesian League, you have Athen League and the treasury, all the money kept there. And for this place, it, it's very important. You know? So I just want to, Paul, if you want to add anything, you know. Um, sure, sure. Well, um, the, just, that um, the, the big turning point in the war was the unsuccessful expedition of the Athenians to the Sicilian city of Syracuse. And everything after that was kind of just uh, waiting for the final curtain to fall, but they no longer had any chance of winning. But the really decisive factor in the war was the Persians. So the Spartans never would have been competitive with the Athenians at sea, except that they were financed by the, the Persians who let them build a navy and, and match the, the Athenians. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you guys. The other really important thing about the plague in 430 BC is that it, was, it led to the death of Pericles, who was the person that formed the uh, Athenian strategy. And uh, there was really uh, no one to carry it forward after his death. So uh, what seemed to be working uh, was abandoned. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, that, that's, uh, and again, like I said, I wanted to show the wall today, but there was nothing that would uh, make it more of a modern way of looking at it. All right. So how does women were perceived at the time of, of that time, you know, when this was written, you know, um, so, uh, the women perception was, you know, when the strata was written, you know, uh, it was an you know, oligarch, oligarch uh, revolution in Athens, which proven briefly successful that same year was more political fall than a Sicilian disaster was. Modern adaptation of the play are often feminist and or pacifist in their aim, but the original play was neither particularly feminist nor un unreservingly pacifist. What's interesting there's another 20 or 30 comedies that are coming from that time, but none of their works survived, except of Aristophanes, which is, which is an interesting fact. And therefore we see it, you know, uh, a difference between new comedy and old economy, uh, academy, him, him presenting the Mrs. Charter and the, the, but we don't know what would the other ones would have looked to compare to. So therefore it's a big hearsay what the contrast of the comedies would look like. Even while- I mean, that, Zach, is that the, that the fact that he survived means that people liked it because Correct. things survived because they were copied. So it's not just an accident, but it means that Aristophanes was widely seen as the master of his genre. Exactly, exactly, exactly. I mean, we, you know, we do have a lot of the uh, uh, interesting ones, even you going back to Gilgamesh time, you know, those things survived because it's passed from mouth to mouth. Even while apparently demonstrating um, empathy with a female condition, Aristophanes still tended to reinforce sexual stereotyping of women as irrational creatures. And we will see it, you know, when the conversation with ambassadors in need of protecting, protection from themselves and from others. Certainly it seemed clear that Aristophanes was not actually advocating real political power for women. So in looking at this text, even though it does look like girl power type of thing, he was not going for that. So, I'll pose a question, maybe you can think of it while we're, you know, we're going through this. If Aristophanes was a woman, you know, um, would, you know, let's say now I call him her, work would survive, you know, like to the polls uh, and, you know, how so? 
what if they found and work later, would the reputation of Athen woman differ uh, than what it is today? Okay, so basically, if it, was, it wasn't a man, it was a woman, would that work survive or not? It's something that to think of as a, as a question uh, for the future. And then, you know, we will get, come back to this. All right. So you guys have to let me know if my presenter's view is going to be viewable, then I'll stop the presenter's view in a second. All right. So what I want to do is right now, obviously, this strata has a lot of characters, right? I want to focus on certain characters because otherwise we're going to be, you know, uh, floating everywhere and uh, not focusing on a particular character. So I'm going to focus about five, six characters, and I'm going to talk about the groups of people. And again, no offense to anybody, but that's apparently how they, uh, you know, delineate the, you know, chorus of older women, chorus of younger, you know, uh, men or whatever it is. However, you want to put it, but that's the, that's the way they delineated things. Um, so to put it all to, in, the, in the general concept. All right, characters. All right, so we have, um, you know, kind of five characters I want to focus on. This is Strata, uh, Colonies, uh, uh, Marine, um, Sinatius, uh, and the ambassador or counselor, however you wanted to name him, it's fine. Um, so first, we're going to talk about Lysis Strata. Now I wanted to point what her character was in the play. And then, you know, we'll obviously dive in into the play itself. All right. And then let me just do a presenter's view. Let me know if you guys see a presenter's view. If not, um, then I'm just continue. All right. Cooking with gas. Oops, sorry. Apologies. All right. All right, one second. Hold on a minute. All right. So, first character is Lysis Strata. So, she's a protagonist, right, of the play. Good looking, you know, woman. Uh, you know, she's basically uh, she's forcing man, so to speak, to, um, you know, uh, uh, I, don't know. I mean, he, she's telling women. Um, to not, you know, uh, have sex with men to stop the war, okay? So uh, she rebels against traditional views, roles of women during this time, um, even though he didn't really mean it to write it that way, but it came out that way. Uh, uh, interior conflict, she constantly questions where her plan works or not. So she, you know, she always kind of reinforces her uh, and being more of a proactive person and reinforcing her plan. Uh, and she makes women to take oath, basically, you know, take an oath, you know, for this or for that. And she makes up things and, you know, oracles and stuff like that. Uh, exterior conflict. Now, she struggles to keep all the women faithful to her plan, obviously, as I've mentioned before. But she's relentless, forcing the man to negotiate peace because, you know, the fact that man has needs, you know, <laughs> and having the man see her not just as a woman, but as a valuable contributor to the state and society. So it kind of like she portrays a man, uh, he portrays a man, portrays, I mean, he, he through her portrays man as being, you know, thinking not through their head, but you know what. Uh, her perspective would not be included in traditional historical accounts because of her status as a woman. And as I've told you before, that, you know, woman didn't really have any status in Athenian society. In her rebellious nature against the traditional gender role of the man, all right? So uh, before we move on to the next uh, thing is I want to talk about a little bit of gods because they're going to play a little bit of a role. Um, so we have, you know, you know, five or six gods that, you know, she refers to, you know, Aphrodite reference in the play a lot based on the sex because she's a goddess of love, um, Artemis, uh, goddess of virginity, the hunt, the moon and nature, Apollo, son of Zeus, Queen Bro uh, Artemis, known as a god of music, healing, medicine, Poseidon, a god of the sea, protector of the aquatic creatures, Dion Dionysus, end of the play, god of wine, and Zeus, god by his car, and then by, by two gods, Artemis and Apollo, you know, she basically swears by it. So, all right, let's just go to the next character before, one second. Oh, for some reason, my presenters, Comments is not showing, but it's all right. No big deal. Okay. 
So what is also Liz Estrada? How she portrays a character? So she's a cool-headed strategist, right? A strong, rhetorical, and articulate spokesperson, not just for women, but for Greek populace, right? She's trying to end the war as a whole, right? I mean, she's obviously trying to be a little bit, a little bit more um, on the women's side where she's saying, you know, all this men um, go to war, my you know, sons, my husbands, my fathers, and therefore there's no men left to procreate. Um, so her complex under, you know, uh, undertake, you know, understanding of both domestic and political and, uh, and international domestic issue, I mean, domestic and uh, political issues um, of unified Greece, you know, she basically, um, she's a parallel to the Athena herself. So she's thinking of it as a goddess in general. He's portraying her as that. Name Lystrata means, oh, by the way, the, the name of Lystrata means disbander of armies, which reflects main goal, okay? She dispends on the armies. So in Greek, it means disband the armies. Any questions or anybody has, uh, uh, or maybe I'm going too quick? No questions? All right. All right, let's go back up. All right, next one, we're talking about her friend, Colonies. Um, and particularly, she's just, you know, um, trying to, uh, one second, guys, give me one second. Apologies. All right, so, um, so Colonies, right? She's a middle-aged woman, um, you know, first arrives, you know, first, first to arrive at the meeting at Lysistrata. As you know, when she called all the women to gather together, they basically were very uh, slow uh, to coming together. And she was the first one to arrive, but she questioned Lysistrata's plan. Uh, basically, she's, you know, she was a little skeptical of it. She said, you know, uh, she doesn't see how a woman can possibly make a difference in the world, in the war. Uh, however, she trusts and supports Mr. Strata and shows this by being the first one to recite an oath and drink the sacrifice of unmixed wine. And we'll talk about what that represents symbolically. Um, you know, in Terry conflict, she struggles with whether to support Mr. Strata, even though she feels that her plan probably will not work, but yet still wants to stand up for herself and other women. Um, exterior conflict. She, like the other women, you know, struggled to remain faithful to the oath while supporting Mrs. Strata and making sure that the other women stayed true and oath as well. Her perspective would not be included in traditional historical accounts because her status as a woman's society during this time was obviously not much. Okay, so let's go to the next character who's more interesting character, uh, Marini, Marie. And so Marie, she's a young, beautiful woman, right? She has a husband. Uh, Cineas, right? And it has a child with him, right? So, you know, during the play, we'll see, you know, where, you know, that's going, but basically, you know, Cineas misses her and there's an oath that was to be taken, right? So now Cineas misses her and if there's an oath to be taken, so she can't break the oath and we'll talk in the play what, what transpires from that. You know, she's upset by the war. She doesn't want her husband to go. I mean, they're telling their husband, are you going to Boeotia? Are you going to Sparta? Are you going to uh, whatever you're going to, but you, you guys are never coming back. And that's, that's an issue. Later on, she struggles to keep the oath with her husband, which I'll mention. In during conflict, she questions whether or not, you know, uh, in, you know, to be faithful to the oath or, you know, to her husband. In Syria conflict, she has, she has to force her husband away and make excuses to him because she promised Mrs. Strada and others she would keep the oath, all right? Her perspective would not be included in traditional historical accounts, because um, though she's married, she's still a woman, did not have a very high status in a society at a time. Okay, so uh, in addition to that, Marine, who need, you know, uh, you know, who basically makes all these flighty excuses in the play. Oh, I have to go, you know, uh, do something with my uh, fur. Uh, otherwise, you know, it would be, you know, uh, it would not, you know, it, it, it may not um, you know, survive or whatever. I have to do woe with the certain things or I have to go take care of my baby and anything she can do to get out of the, this oath. And um, you know, she's obviously uh, comes out of unreliable and you know, to us, she's very reluctant uh, to give up her sexual 
and uh, also eager to drink wine a lot. You know, I mean, uh, so she also featured in all the scenes that best illustrates the sex strike in action. Working her husband, uh, you know, and I'm, we'll talk about, but uh, which is her husband, Sanitas, into passion and then abandoning him, showing the demonstration of the Lisa Stratus plan in action, right? So in the end, even though she's luring him, she still, you know, stands up to her, you know, with, with her plan. Aristophanes' audience may have interpreted uh, marine action as typical of a woman treachery, but she also represents a woman's desire to affect social change using the only tools available to them, their bodies. Okay. So any questions, anybody wants to uh, contribute or? No, I'll make a comment. Um, I, I think that from the point of view of the Athenians, this play is a total fantasy because it was inconceivable that women would do something like that. So it's almost like this was a, a, a play about imaginary characters. The, the role of women in this society was so restrictive, uh, at least well-born women, um, it's very unlikely that a woman would even be literate. And um, the, uh, one of the things that comes across, I mean, written by a man, one of the Greek stereotypes was the belief that women were sexually voracious and that every woman uh, would um, look for the opportunity to have sex at the drop of a hat under any circumstances. And um, this is, you know, really pervades all of the comments that are made and, and, and the, the action of the characters. The women can't control themselves. Right. Wouldn't that be part of the joke though? Well, but it was, it would be part of a joke if it was a joke, but if it was the way that everybody thought and the way that everybody acted, uh, then, I mean, it's just confirming mm -hmm. popular belief. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's exactly, you know, also, I, I don't know if you guys know this, but homosexuality was pretty prevalent at the Greek times, but it was uh, uh, during the youth, youth time, the Greek, uh, so to speak, uh, it was a passage of, passage of right for uh, uh, a young Greek person. And, you know, obviously he would uh, gain uh, a favor of an older gentleman. And uh, this, you know, this would, you know, uh, contribute to this homosexual relationship. So I think it's also contributed in a lot of the fact, you know, um, to, you know, to the women being uh, uh, a different society uh, level standing. I mean, there's no standing for them at, at, at the time, but uh, yeah, it was obviously unfortunate, but, um, but it also could be very misconstrued. Um, you know, it was only at certain time that certain Greek men, you know, uh, uh, practiced uh, homosexuality and therefore uh, uh, it was not uh, a permanent state, so to speak. Now, is that true? Was that true? I, I, my understanding is that the pre classical Greeks were thoroughly homosexual. Their, their love poetry is all about their love for young boys and stuff like that. But I thought they were pretty head. I mean, this is partially what got Socrates in trouble. He was an old fart and he, he was a homosexual and an old fart. Um, <clears throat> Well, uh, the, some of them had developed relationships, even you know, going further in their career. But mostly, in a, yeah. in, a, in a big percentage, it was patronage type of thing, where mm -hmm. you know uh, they had a patron, and basically he would take a person through a political uh, uh, or you know general uh, or this you know uh, army type of ranking based on the relationship, uh, interpersonal relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, the Lysistrata itself is is evidence because. Yeah. If, if, if it was the case that, that uh, a large majority of Greeks were homosexual, the, the, the whole play wouldn't make any sense, right? The play is based under the assumption that men want to have sex with women. That's, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the basic assumption underlying the entire play. So well, that, that, we shouldn't that overestimate. That might be the last thing. Okay, sorry. We shouldn't overestimate the role. I mean, certainly no. there's, there's a difference between the, the um, role of, of of men uh, taking lovers as opposed to people who are life, lifetime homosexuals and are not attracted to women at all. These people who would go through these 
relationships with a younger man or an older man when they were young would still get married, would still have children. You know, if anything, they were bisexual. It could, I, I wonder about, the, I mean, this is sort of an aristocratic culture. So like the Spartans were homosexual. Uh, when the Thebans did their sacred band, they were homosexual. They were paired with their lovers. Um, and maybe the Athens is more of a middle-class crowd that weren't as into that. Well, uh, no, it's more like a question of it being yeah. a phase of life. Correct. Yeah. It's something that you grow out of. Right. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's definitely a stage, you know, of, uh, you could almost have passage to, to, to be yeah. adult, because they, the, the boys, I think were not supposed to be, um, uh, lower than 10 and greater than 14. Uh, so it, it was, it was a time period. And then at 19, when it grows a beer, yet this relationship had to stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any, any, anybody else have any questions now? Okay, moving on, sorry. Mm. Uh, and again, this is very um, interactive type of, uh, so don't, don't be shy. All right, uh, Cineas, uh, that's the husband. And on this picture, I mean, this is theatrical performance, but you can clearly see uh, they're pretty, have hearts for each other, right? So who is Cineas, you know, Marine's husband? Um, and he's angry, he's part of the scheme try to appreciate her to come back home and be with him, right? Uh, he tries to use uh, their child as a way to convince her, but also, you know, you know, he was trying to seduce her, you know, come back and stuff like that. Um, uh, he becomes even angrier than Maureen and keeps refusing him. She keeps refusing, she keeps stalling him. And in the play, it's funny, uh, in, in the book, maybe it's not as, as, um, as apparent, but in the play, you could see he goes like, okay, I'm going to bring a blanket for us to lay down. <laughs> and then he goes, no, uh, you know, it's okay. We'll just have sex on the, uh, um, on the grass. I said, no, 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 you're going to hurt your back. Let's, <laughs> let's, uh, let's maybe do this. Let's do that. And at the end, she goes like, I'm sorry, we're not doing it. Uh, so her interior, in, you know, he's in interior, uh, interior conflict. He really does not want to negotiate peace, but knows he will get his wife to give up oath and come back to you know home a serious conflict he wants to be with marine but she keeps refusing and stays faithful to, you know to the oath his perspective will be included in traditional historical accounts because he's a man at a prominent position in state affairs i think we have a question somebody just posted oh sorry i have to go very good i missed it sorry okay all right next um Next character is the uh, consular or ambassador, however you want to call it. Uh, this is a person who basically, you know, shows up and tried to tell Lysis Strata, who the hell do you think you are? He, you know, he's a special consular who handles state affairs and consular of 500. You know, we know 500, that's the consular of, you know, Athens. He's furious that new women have decided this is, you know, locked for themselves in the Acropolis. Of all the places, they lock themselves in the Acropolis. That's ridiculous, you know? Well, somebody else just left. All right, no problem. Okay, uh, locked themselves in Acropolis. So why is Acropolis important? I have mentioned this, this, there was two different leagues, right? There was a Peloponnesian League and there was Athen League. You know, all the money that were collected uh, for Athen League were actually left in the treasury in Acropolis itself, you know, Parthenon. Um, and so that's, that's an interesting fact. Uh, you know, he comes with guards to try to break, you know, the doors down. It is women as having no place in state affairs and continually insults Louis Strata and other women. He thinks that their rebellion may diminish his power and prestige in government. You know, so he tells her, who do you think you are? You have no standing in a society. You know, why don't you just, you know, you know, stay at home and do your home chores, you know, uh, don't try to challenge us. Interior conflict he needs to crush his, this rebellion to whatever way possible, or risk the position of both government and society. Exterior conflict, he tries to break down the doors, force women to give up the schema, scheme, uh, but they uh, continually insult him and publicly humiliate him by forcing him, dressing him, dressing him up as a woman. <laughs> his perspective would be included in traditional historical account. He's a man that has a um, high uh, position in government. So let's go to the plot itself. 
All right. All right. So, uh, starting from the beginning, right? So, um, Lisa Strata uh, gathers all the women and she basically tells them, listen, um, and, you know, first one was Colonies, which I was read, reading, you know, about. She's saying that um, calls up the meeting for women in surrounding territories like Sparta and discuss, uh, and, and she wants to discuss the plan that, that came up in her mind. Uh, so Lysistrata complains to colonies that other women are late and they should be there to get a meeting started. So she's a kind of, kind of, some kind of like head woman and she wants to collect all the women at one place in um, Acropolis to discuss the plan how to stop the war. Lysistrata worries that all the women in Greece need to work together or the war will wipe everyone out. Basically, she's saying, if we work together as women, we could stop the war between uh, Athens and uh, Peloponnesian League uh, and, you know, in, ahead of Sparta. Uh, now, Colonies has severe doubts. She's like, what are you talking about? Women has a place in, in a society, you know, and we can't really do anything. We can't devise any plan. Somebody has a question. Oh, I um, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, I, I when I read this part, I have a little bit question on this. So, since Athens and, and uh, Sparta are in the war, so look, guys, the people can still free to travel around between the two places. Uh, no, <laughs> that's my concern. You know. So uh, they were not. In fact, they were in, in history. Uh, the Athens that are uh, people from Athens that went to Sparta was looked very strangely. As you know, Sparta was a um, warrior society. Yeah, you cannot go there, but the Sparta, the Spartan can come to Athens during the time? There was, the there was some interconnect, in, Spartans came to Athens to study because there was a lot of philosoph philosophers, mathematicians in Athens and they came to study. It was a, you would think of it as, if you, you talk about Middle East, they were about Baghdad at the time, right? All the, Muslims went to Baghdad to study science. Uh, the whole world, in fact, came to Baghdad and Damascus to study science. So Athens was like the cultural center of the whole, you know, Greece, Dorian Greece. Um, so even during the war, they, the Spartans are still able to travel to- Not during the war, but during the peacetime, right. During the war, no. Because but the way the war happened, yeah. The war- Yeah, the, the war point is here, uh, the the, the, the sister can call the woman from, uh, I think, uh, from Sparta, right? And also from the cities, right? So they are able to, she's able to gather all the women from the enemy side together. Right. That's the part I'm a little bit, you know. Yeah, uh, well, you're absolutely confused. right. It, it didn't make any sense. That's why it's a, it's a play, it's a comedy, it's not real. Uh, you know, in, in, in all respects, women in Sparta actually had a better standing than women in Athens. In women in Sparta actually had a voting rights and they sent their man to war saying, either you come on a shield, with a shield or on a shield. I don't know if you ever watched 300, women were very, very high society. In fact, in order to marry a woman in Sparta, man has to uh, chase and, you know, kind of like snatch her. Otherwise, you know, they were stronger than men, some of the women in Sparta, and men were afraid of them. Uh, uh, and that's why for her to have Spartan women, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, Spartan women was very, um, very strong. Uh, uh, so she needed Spartan women there, but it's more, more of a symbolism than anything. I don't think they were able to come during the war. Well, don't, don't forget, Greeks lived very close together and they all spoke the same language. So probably if you know somebody can write letters. I don't think the Spartan women were bigger than men. They were bigger than women in other, other parts of Greece because they were given full rations or food or whatever. Mm. Right. But the, the thing is that, uh, I don't know if you know Peloponnesian War, uh, Spartans, that war lasted for a long time. Uh, and therefore, uh, to, to have people come back and forth would be impossible because first it was a siege war. Basically Spartans just parked next to the Athens and Pericles was trying to wait them out and he starved his own people inside Athen walls. So for people to move around, it would be impossible because they would probably get killed, right? 
Uh, so now um, that's that. All right, let me just uh, next piece. All right. So what does she devise, right? What is what is what is the uh, uh, Lisa Shara device, right? Uh, she basically saying, um, you know, uh, listen, um, she's telling women finally start arriving. So all the women came and now she's telling them, um, you know, I propose that all women refuse sex with their husbands unless they agree to end the war and make peace. And let me tell you, she went graphic, okay? She said, you cannot open your legs. You cannot do this. You can't even kiss. It's over for them. Unless they end the war, we don't want it, you know? And she used the uh, particular language of saying, you know, uh, how, can, how come all these men leave us? And sometimes we can't even get married because there is no man to get married. But then they come back and they marry younger women and then leave us all, you know, kind of like in the dust. Um, so the women became, you know, to protest. So they try to look, you know, Lampito to support. Uh, you know, um, it, she was, you know, a support. They sort of urges women that they have to take an oath to solidify this plan. And the oath was taken through wine. And we'll talk about symbolism, what it means. They make a sacrifice using a bowl and a mixed wine, right? Um, Calonese is the first to recite the oath and drink the wine and the rest of the women follow, okay? So basically, uh, that's that. Um, So now they lock themselves in Acropolis. So what I wanted to do right now, I want to go through the Acropolis, how it looked. Uh, and then, you know, we'll talk about it, you know, obviously. So the first one is Parthenon. So this is Parthenon. This is where the treasury was locked. Uh, so the Athen League collected all the money and they put it in there for the whole league. Okay. So if the women took over Acropolis, a man has no funding to fight the war. So they're, they're smart women, right? So the second one was the um, Eratrium. Uh, third one was uh, Prapalia, and then they're, they're all marked. Fourth, the Temple of Athena was very important too. It was kind of like a cult society. So for them to take over the Acropolis and Temple of Athena was important. It was you know, almost uh, saying like, we are in charge. Statue of Athena um, uh, Pramahos, which was right here. So now I want to do what I want to do is I want to go to Google Earth. And I'm gonna look at the Acropolis from Google Earth and then we'll try to, um, one second. By the way, if any, any questions or you want to add anything, let me know. Um, so right now I'm sharing. All right, Google Earth. All right, let me know if you see it. Can you see it? This is a real time Acropolis, all right? No. Okay, this is the, and then we can, we'll, we'll look at it a little closer, but so obviously built by Pericles and uh, I mean, none of the other stuff survives uh, in, in the same shape, but that's basically, it. and so Google Earth, you can see it. Hmm. Hmm. 360, how you can see it. Okay, and we just talked about, you know, uh, and it's interesting that like we're doing all the columns right now and it's almost from scratch. So let me just uh, go in different spots so this way you can see it. Um, it's all 3D. Hmm. So if you go to, let's say, what do we want to go? Let's say here. Um, can I ask a quick question? Yes. Was the original Acropolis most likely built by slave labor? Uh, I think, shit. <laughs> the Athenians <laughs> had lots of slaves, and probably slaves doing a lot of really boring scut work. Correct. Correct. But I'm not sure, like regular craftsmen got to sit, got to sit in the city councils and stuff like that in Athens. I'm not. They had lots of slaves, they and did. they must have been doing something. Right. The, what's yeah. interesting, I don't know about Athens. Uh, in Sparta, uh, they use helots. So Sparta's maybe Athens used something similar. Helots was um, 
uh, uh, next neighboring Greek states that were enslaved by Spartans. You know, the Helots were a Spartan thing. My understanding is when the Athenians helped the Spartans put down a Helot revolt, the Athenians were disturbed that the Helots spoke Greek. So I think in Athens, the, the slaves were barbarians of some sort. Right, right. And then so they, they used slavery uh, quite extensively, but it was other Greeks. It wasn't um, any right. other nationality. So there was other Greeks. So you know, it was, um, and then it took um, Pericles a while to rebuild this, thirty almost thirty years uh, when he rebuilt this, and obviously there was part of a golden age uh, by Pericles. That was his creation. So, was the um, golden age the fifth century BC? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Sorry. That's correct. Which is actually where most of the um, uh, um, Aristophanes uh, we didn't go through his other works. Frog, the uh, uh, the other uh, things that he wrote with Lysistrata was written around that same age, same thing, same time. So the look, I said the crane. So Greeks is try to rebuild it now. Yes, but the the problem is that they don't have the original um, original uh, procedure how to build it. So they do it piece by piece now. So they take a column, they separate it. And within the column, they have, you know, <laughs> it's almost it's almost like a Legos Legos part, and in between, it has a wooden uh, wooden stick that holds them together. So they gotta be very careful. They go piece by piece by piece there, and that's why it takes them very long. It takes them longer than Pericles. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, are we able to visit, or it's uh, to walk there? Well, you, you, you're here now, you know, what do you need I to- Oh, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> After pandemic and I got the money, I go there, so. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. No, I, I've never been to uh, Acropolis. I'd love to go. I mean, I, you know, it, it looks really nice. Um, yeah, it would be interesting to go to, to have a walk around, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, obviously, you know, I mean, we can go to other places these days, you know, like Lebanon, Syria has a lot of the stuff like that, but this is the one that is safest, I guess, to go. Um, even though in pandemic nothing is safe, but <laughs> so that's that. Uh, let me go back to the presentation. I think the original columns were actually put together in pieces as well. Those weren't, they, they, they put them up in sections. Correct. They weren't put in pieces, correct. Yeah. All right. So uh, let me just stop sharing. And again, I apologize. I keep switching. I got to figure out how to switch seamlessly. All right, sharing now back. All right, so now um, we talked about Acropolis. So they take over Acropolis, right? Uh, and for some reason, they call themselves, you know, uh, you know, chorus of 12 women, you know? Now, what's interesting in the play, they keep pointing out women were, you know, middle age or older man was older why do you think they pointing out that the man was older they came to burn the uh, burn this women from the acropolis the smoke them out why do you think in general what you know what happens to young people during the wartime they fight right so uh when the women barricaded acropolis uh the chorus of 12 old men came to smoke women out and saying, you guys are taking our treasury. We can't fund wars anymore. What are you guys doing? And also took a temple of Athena where that's a cult, right? That's where they go to pray. Is that you can't, we can't pray anymore either. So they came to smoke or even burn those women out. And this older, you know, women, 12 women came in and threw jugs of water at this older man saying, sorry, you know, you can't do that because we're standing for something here. Um, and so, uh, you know, both sides start throwing insult to each other, you know, uh, and women obviously poured water onto the men. So now they want to send ambassador to deal with this women, right? They say, I know you guys are standing for something. You know, you, you don't want to, you know, you, you know, you don't want to give up sex. For whatever and you guys are standing and you took our treasury 
we can't vouch, you know, we can't, you know, vouch wars and stuff like that. What do you want from us? You know, but it, that goes the wrong way about it. He started insulting Lisa Strata. You know, Council enters the attempt to get slaves to pry the doors open and stop this. So he's sending slaves in to open the doors and saying, listen, open the doors. I'm going to, you know, get you out. You know, Lisa Strata comes out and, um, you know, and with some older woman threatens the guard if they come near. Okay, so the women now threatening, so they have some, they've created some status for themselves. Some women attack the guard and the counselor asks Lisa Strata uh, the reasons behind this plan. She replies that they're keeping the money here so there will be none of the war. Um, the counselor argues as to why women have this authority in state matters, to which Lisa Strata explains that women have always kept quite even, uh, quite even through uh, they were not pleased with that, you know, with what was the, what was decided. So what she's saying is, you telling you telling me we're housewives, but look, we're keeping up the um, the house chores, right? You know, we take care of the kids. You know, we uh, we're making clothes, we're making shoes. You know, we take care of you know food. We're already ready to run the government. Who are you to tell us we can't, we're running, we're gonna run the government just like the way we run the household. And we're gonna probably go do a better job than you. So counselor is completely upset, you know. Uh, you know, uh, and, but women are strong and they wanna you know, be left in charge of all this. So let's continue. Uh, now counselor leaves, he's upset, you know, he's insulted, um, you know, very angry. But remember, women made an oath, oath not to have sex with men. And now all this men, and it's interesting, the moniker, they have all this men walking around with props, you know, very large phalluses, props in the plate. And uh, obviously, you know, they wanna, they wanna have relationships with women, but they're denied. So unless you stop the war, we're not gonna give it to you. It's a political statement. So uh, what's interesting is several days later, Strata is upset because all the women are making excuses and trying to break the oath uh, they swore. So women are saying, enough is enough. You know, we, you know, let's, this whole strike wears itself out. Maybe we should just go back home or give ourselves to, you know, to men. And Mr. Strata encourages the women to be patient by reading a fake scroll that she claims the Oracle gave for saying that their plan will work if they stick to it. All right, so she's, she took the scroll and she said, listen, Oracle said the future will, you know, we will win. Why don't you stay with us? You know, the women then spot a man approaching who Marie recognizes her husband, Sinaeus. So now her husband approaches and then, you know, by himself and he goes, can you call Marie? I want to talk to her. So anyway, uh, Lisa Strata reminds Marie, listen, you can lead the Sinaeus on, but you cannot have sex with him. Uh, absolutely not. And Sinaeus instructs Lisa Strata to bring Marie out to him. Lysstrata keeps stalling, which makes Sinaeus even angrier. So Lysstrata finally agrees and Marie comes out. So, I mean, I can't really prevent, you know, she wants to come out and talk to her husband. And Marie, you know, is hesitant to Sinaeus, uses their child as an excuse to get her come up, come home. But, you know, she tells her husband she's not coming back until the men agree to make peace. So she basically stalls, you know, the living. She tells him, okay, I'm gonna, you know, undress, we'll have sex. Oh, wait, 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 but you can't lay on the ground. I have to put some blanket on. Oh, wait, 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 you can't do this. Oh, we can't have this too, it's too public. Let's go in you know, private. And he got so upset, it's like, okay, I, you know, either you do, either you're with me or you're not with me. So obviously it does something to Sinaeus, right? Now he's a, he's a man and it does something to him. So let's see what, he, you know, what, what it does. So what's interesting is Sinaeus finds a, a friend in this, 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 Spartan Herald, you know, uh, enters and asks Sinaeus where he can find the directors in town so they can talk about the compromise. So the, the Spartan Herald wanted to compromise because all the Spartan women left. So now, you know, Spartan Herald and Sinaeus saying, listen, we have no other, you know, plan. We have to, you know, give up, you know, our stand and maybe we should stop war. So now we have a Spartan and, and Sinaeus probably from Athens and, or you can talk to Athens, the ambassador, and make the peace because of it. So now Sinaeus tells the Spartan Herald to send ambassadors to Athens so they can proceed to make treaty so they can have their women back. Both choruses continue to insult one another. 
So you have older women, older men insulting each other, trying to smoke each other out. One is throwing water at them. And, you know, uh, and then they decided to, you know, unite and have and celebrate because that they got tired of it, you know. So now both Spartan and Athenians ambassadors arrived complaining about how they have been played by women. However, they all agreed that Lysistrata should be the referee in their negotiations. So now they're saying, okay, we can't, we're still probably going to be having war, but let's see if Lysistrata can negotiate this. So Lysistrata arrives with an attractive women who represent reconciliation to further attempt the men into peace. So now let's see what happens next. So Lysistrata, basically the ambassador from both sides are enthralled with reconciliation as Lysistrata addresses the, the many things each side has done wrong, okay? Uh, they then take out a map and every side div dis divides the land and territory up the evenly. So she said, let's just divide everything evenly. So she had proven the case that she could be political. She could, be, she could do a better job than men. Lysistrata tells the ambassadors that as soon as they agree to peace, they can all feast, pledge their good faith and take their wives home. So she used that as a bait. She said, you can take all your wives home and they'll cook all the food for you. Men is probably hungry. They don't know how to cook and stuff like that. Lysistrata and the ambassadors leave to, to make a final settlement as the slaves settle down and wait outside, okay? The ambassador from both sides return and begin you know, beating the slaves who are in the way and have fallen asleep. <laughs> The slaves uh, flee as both Spartan and Arthenian ambassadors begin to see each other as friends. Other Spartan ambassadors return with Piper, who is instructed to play a song in honor of their new friendship uh, with Athenians. Lysistrata arrives with Spartan and Athenian women, instructs the men to take their wives and vote to never uh, to go so wrong again. Uh, the couples join the United Chorus and dance in pairs and rejoice their victory. Okay, so now let's talk about a little bit of symbolism. Any questions? Right. I think the, at the end, they presented a, a slave woman, right? A slave girl? Correct. Yeah, correct. okay. I think that's the important part, but I... I, I... No, that's correct. It's, uh, it's correct uh, because, you know, the, it, it is an important part. Uh, yeah, probably I, when I read this one, I think they use a lot of the sex, you know, uh, for example, like they assume the man without a woman heaven heaven have a sex heaven have sex for a few days they all have the erection and walking right. around I think that's their their assumption uh, the uh, Aristophanes uh, assumption. That's correct. So uh, what is the symbolism of all this in the review of the play? Right. So, um, well, one second. So basically, the symbolism is. They use a lot of props, like you know, staffs, for example, you know, that will you know walking with sticks and spears can symbolize power or weakness. So, you know, people walking with spears and sticks, it could symbolize both things. So, for example, what is a chorus of old men, you know, use uh, walking sticks to help convey their um, you know uh, decredit condition? So, why is it important that they said that old men attack the Acropolis? They're saying they're using sticks to walk. So the man is the, the credit condition at the moment. So women are above them in that case. Um, but, uh, you know, Arist Aristanis, uh, the, the author, uh, and other comics uh, dramatists weren't shy about the use of phallic imaginary. I think there's a time in the play where everybody just takes their clothes off and like walking around, dancing around naked. Uh, male characters in Lys Lysistrata probably wore a prop fallacies throughout the play, staffs, swords, and so on could also be phallic symbols of male power, okay? So the fact that they were wearing all these props, they were showing their male power. For instance, this is shot of women complain about the man who walked around marketplace fully armed with spears, uh, suggests that this over the top martial display is ridiculous in the co context of buying figs. So that's the symbolism saying, you guys are ridiculous, you know, to the point you're trying to, you know, with all, uh, you know, I'm sorry, with your phalluses out, with your, all the weapons out, you're trying to show you're a man, but you're not. When a magistrate accuses the herald of uh, hiding an uh, erection under his clock, uh, the herald lies and, and says that uh, protrusion is a Spartan herald stick. <laughs> 
So there was the Spartan Herald who was trying to enter women's uh, Acropolis and he had an erect penis. Uh, you know, he was trying to tell ambassador, no, 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 he wasn't erect, don't worry about it. Otherwise, the ambassador would think that he give up to women because now, you know, he, they got him by the, you know, sorry to say, by cojones. In usual, this case of phallic imaginary uh, makes the man look not powerful, but ridiculous. Yeah. So uh, next. So why why do you think in the beginning when they were trying to use uh, instead of the use kind of like a blood oath, they used bowls and wine instead of using spears and machete, they use that because that's a women's power, right? Bowls and wine, that's more house a symbolism. So bowls and wine are also symbols. Women power is strong force in the Sestrata. Not only women take over the treasury, but they also appropriate and transport, uh, you know, symbols of, of male martial power into feminine symbols like bowls and, and wine, like shields, helmets, blood now replaced with bowls and jugs of wine. The first time the bowls and wine make their appearance, the women are considered sealing their woe of chastity with blood sacrifice and, shield, and a shield instead of the women swear the bowl of wine by replacing the shield with a similar yet different object, a bowl. The women usurped and transform a symbol of power. Later in the play, a female character adopts and transport another male symbol uh, power. An Athenian woman hides her garment. And Mrs. Strata correctly suspects she, uh, she does so to simulate pregnancy. So one of the women took a helmet and hid it under her cloak to simulate the pregnancy. The women uh, rid ridiculous cues is that she plans to use the helmet as a bowl in which to give birth as a nest as, as it were. So she said she wants to give birth inside the uh, helmet, which makes no sense. What better symbol of female fertility? Another symbol was Parthenon, as it served as a vault of money collecting from Athens, um, Athenian uh, uh, allies and intending for their pr protection was stored there. It symbolized the financial power. Also, Parthenon was a citadel and home to high priest, priestesses of the city called Athena. It was born almost honored and uh, religious institution along with uh, their female staff. All right, so let's just close this. Opinion. Um, so do you think that uh, the, uh, do you think that the plan the strata came up with was only a way to end the war, negotiate the peace? Could there have been any other way to stop the man from fighting? Why and why not? Do you guys, I just want to pose a question. Uh, does anybody think that there was any other way? Hello? <laughs> Is anybody around? <laughs> I can't think of anything. Um, hiding their weapons is dangerous. Okay. Yeah, that's true. So what is injustices in this uh, particular play that we see? Athenian, Athenian women and citizenship. Athenian women were not given citizenship. Uh, you know, injustices or nonviolent protest. Obviously, you know, that's one of the things that's trying to protest. Modern audience and slavery. And then the last thing I wanted to do is the uh, finish with the let me see if I have any presenters. Notes. There's a comment about citizenship there. In ancient Greece and ancient Rome and the Republic and the democracy and republics, nobody had citizenship unless they could participate in the war. Uh, Athenia was Athens was a broad basis it was because it had a navy and somebody had to row the boats. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I think in order for you to be in the uh, uh, the consular, right, uh, or senate or whatever it is, uh, it was, uh, you know, what is it, a hundred or five hundred? You have to go through war, otherwise you won't be elected, and you cannot get uh, the rations, right? The government do, during Pericles, that's or during the Salon, that's when they created the ra rations, right? You can't get food, so if you didn't go through war, you can't get food, you die. You know, if you're not a citizen, you can't get those rations. 
So one more thing I want to talk about, what is what does this play represent? So major, major themes. First one, determination. Uh, bargains with wavering women, how to solve this chastity that, uh, that involves that they placed. Uh, Lisa Strada. She initially convinces women to swear that oath uh, on a jug of wine. Um, as sex strikes wear on, she must repeatedly beg, threaten, <laughs> cajole women to keep their going, to keep it going. Even more impressively, her resolve in the face of threats from the magistrate, while menaces for when insults and threat violence, she presents uh, cogent reason for the strike. So uh, ambas ambassador came and is like, "You are nothing. What are you? What are you trying to do here?" And she still is, you know, has a resolve. Speaking with unrelated men, well, basically, if you are not related to uh, a particular man, you're not allowed to speak to that man. So she's already kind of breaking the rules here. And the speaking with unrelated men, such as magistrate, uh, was a strict forbidden. Also, femininity versus masculinity. When Lisa Strada compared women work to governing, she threatened, she, uh, she threatens that very meaning of the manhood is in Athens a fragile male ego is in charge. Uh, it may be the threat of women close to masculinity rather than their withholding of the sex that really drives warring parties to negotiate table. They were afraid that men and women are gonna take over. Uh, civil disobedience. This Strada campaign has hallmarks of civil disobedience. Uh, disenfranchised women band together and to defy laws and norms of, uh, to bring about a political change and the war, they mount a sex strike and seize the tre uh, treasury, bringing their husband to their knees and depriving warmongers, uh, warmongering the military funding uh, through collective action helps the women achieve their purpose. They return to political and, pow in, and powerless role as part of the bargain. After they said, we're done with the strike, we're going back to being women and we don't have any quarrel to anything else. I just want to read a couple of quotes and then I think we'll end the night. Uh, or a couple of, I thought was interesting from the text. Colonies, remember that's her friend that arrived first at the meeting. What thoughtful thing could a woman ever do? What vivid venture? We just sit decked out in saffron gowns, make up about the thick, uh, Cambrian lingerie and platform shoes, the strata, stoves that I intend to save our race, those dresses and perfume and row and shoes, a little see-through numbers that we wear. Okay, that's the first one. Second one is kind of longer, but let's just give it a shot. Say that the wool mass of a tangle, take it thus, Draw it apart with uh, spindles, make some sense of it. That's how we'll loosen up with this wet. We were allowed, ambassadors are spindles, they can sort it out. With a medicum of smarts, could have copied an administration of the wool. First, give a fleece, a bath to dunk, away the sheep dunk, spread your city on the bed next, and beat out a uh, layer bounce and briars. Then cut out your clumps, you know, the uh, clicks of chumps, um, magistry mangers, pluck their little heads off, wet in their residence, aliens and nice foreigners, and don't leave out public debtors. And heck, as of the city scattered colonies, I want you to construe them as neglected turf. Each of the lonesome, gather them all together and bunch them tight, and finally you'll have one. Big all, use it to weave the city something fine. All right, this is the two, things I thought was most important, but um, any questions or any additions? Oh, one, one last thing I wanted to do is the major works that he did, uh, author, I didn't get to it, uh, and the times. So uh, one of the first ones he wrote was, you know, obviously the clouds, uh, <clears throat> and then he wrote wasps on 422, frogs, 405, uh, women of ther thermophoria, uh, Festival of Thermophoria 411, and then Lisa Strada was a little bit later. That's basically it. That's my presentation. Mm -hmm. Woo <laughs> oh, somebody's oh. back. Hmm? So, any questions? Uh, anybody has anything to add on Lisa Strada? This was really interesting reading, I'd say, but it was different from what we usually do. If anybody has any kind of additions to 
what we want to read next. Uh, you know, was was this was this before or after? Was this done before or after they attacked Sicily? This was done after. Yeah. Because the Sicily campaign was how the Polynesian Peloponnesian War started. Uh, it was no, they're well into it by the time they did that. Right. That was that saw, was it was it was like in the middle of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was one of the. You know, at the end, it was after thought. But in the in the hindsight, in the twenty twenty vision of of hindsight, you could see that it was a mind boggling, stupid thing to do. Well, you know, they thought that. Uh, there is no way that Spartans can build something to rival us. And they were so mistaken. Does it remind you of the first, first Punic War with Romans? It's exactly what it is. They thought, the Carthaginians thought Romans would never, in fact, in the beginning of the first Punic War, they were laughing at them. They were, they were when they came up with the, uh, what it was, 20 or 30 ships in, uh, to, to, to conquer one of the uh, uh, Sicilian towns, they, you know, they were laughing at them. They were you know, like, what is going on here? You guys don't have any uh, capabilities. And then when they came out with Corvus, who was laugh who were laughing at them then? You know, and later on, they obviously copied Carthaginians, but they was not, uh, it was not. Yeah, but, you know, if, if the, Persian, the Persians weren't bribing the Romans to continue the war. Persians, well, you're talking about, at that time it was already Parthians. And in, in the in the Peloponnesian War, the Persians funded the Spartans. Oh, Persians, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, uh, which, they, which they, is a whole lot of fun after you if you've watched the movie Three Hundred. Yeah, but yeah, exactly with the Artem Artemisium. Yeah, exactly. That that's funny. I mean, I, I don't know. Artemisium was actually kind of like semi true. I'm gonna be doing a segment uh, going forward. I'm probably gonna do some at the end of September, beginning of October. We're gonna take a movie, and we're gonna dissect the movie to whether it it, um, it it references the history correctly. Uh, so the first movie we're gonna do is uh, uh, first movie we're gonna do is uh, obviously the uh, uh, what is it called uh, the Gladiator, and then oh. uh, and then you know probably the one fun one fun wants to do is. 300, uh, the Artemisium, the second 300. Uh, you know, we can do uh, Rome series, uh, Spartacus, uh, stuff like that. Yeah, I find the 300 movies fun, but historically, they're the, particularly the 300 Birth of an Empire is, is uh, very little connection to reality. Yeah. Anusha, is message, the message is the movie, right? Um, yeah, the Islamic one. Oh, oh Islamic. Oh, that's that's on the uh, uh, Muhammad. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, yeah, yeah. that one's supposed to be awful. Why? Uh, well, the whole point of religious movies is you get a, you do the tits and togas, the women and skimpy outfits, you do all kinds of fun and moral stuff, and then God strikes them all with a thunderbolt at the end, making the whole thing morally correct. Um, the, the 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 guys making Muhammad were trying to stick close to Islamic theory or whatever theology. So they can't do any of that crap, and they can't portray Muhammad. All right, all right. My understanding is that I've not seen it. My understanding is it's a truly awful movie. So anyway, I'm looking for advice on what next text do you guys want to read or are interested in. I did this one mostly like a fun one. We usually stay with a more classical like Plutarch, you know, Aristotle, and you know, if you guys want to do a piece. Let me know from ancient time, Rome, Greece. Uh, I, I would be glad to utilize it for next month. Um, and like I said, you know, uh, anybody wants to step up and maybe do it just like what I did today um, type of stuff where we, we talk about, you know, and sometimes we also talk about the, the type of uh, reading, you know, uh, what kind of theme is, is this, you know, uh, like I said, I was talking about new comedy, old comedy, but people sometimes, you know, talk about style of writing. Uh, Aristophanes obviously is comedy. I mean, I, I'm not necessarily, you know, wanting to dive into the style of writing, you know, but we've talked about Plutarch. We, it's interesting, especially the beat that the Plutarch goes on, you know. Well, I and, thought, and, and I, that was me with King Pyrrhus. I, I, Plutarch has imposed Greek tragedy onto the tale of King Pyrrhus. Correct. 
and he's done so brutally. Uh, you, you see the same thing when you read about the Titanic, um, where, where they emphasize all the crucial Greek tragedy elements to the point we have to wonder how accurate the story is. Um, but a combination. I am curious about Joan of Arc. I, according to the word, the word Lord, the Lord Wood, damn it, Lord Woodhouse Lee's Universal History has a very different version of the story. In my opinion, his version is way more credible. I, well, like, I don't believe the Archangel Michael appeared to her. We did when we did Gilgamesh, and and it's on the uh, YouTube channel. Uh, yeah, we did a different version of it, and John uh, that did it did a pretty amazing job and literally like recited the text from the old Sumerian, you know? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I was just sitting there like mesmerized. He has a PhD in, uh, uh, in, in those, dis you know, uh, extinct languages. And I've got I the books. Oh, wow. That's getting scary. I've got the book here somewhere. Um, there's a rep cinema here in Toronto and a guy named Reg Hart puts, puts on a presentation of Gilgamesh periodically. Oh, I see. I, I have no idea what it's like. It's probably absolutely crazy. I see. All right, guys. I'm going to wish you uh, tomorrow, if you guys want, join me for the uh, kind of change the mood for huh. the uh, FIFA World Cup uh, 1930. What is it? 1930s to current time. You know, what's his name? Aaron is going to present if I get a hold of Aaron. But uh, Sunday... Today, you see, Howard went well. There was no hackers. Yeah. I, I took care of it, you know. <laughs> what, what, what did you, I, like, my, basically, I sat down and played with a couple. I got multiple computers here, so I loaded Zoom up, and then I trolled, and I tried to troll myself as my cat um, and look for stuff that would work. And I figure if you turn, uh, basically, there was one, there may have been two trolls, not one, but they kept changing their name. Uh, we are responsible grown-ups. We're logging in as ourselves. There's no need for us to be able to do that. And that means if you get a troll, they always have the same name. You can't change their name. The only person that can change their name is you. And by the time you're inclined to do that, you're pissed off at them. So, um, <laughs> uh, you know, be imaginative. Um, and there, there's a button on the participants right now. You can, yeah. change, you can stop changing names. Yes, that's my point. Yeah. And also, yeah, you pull that up and stop that. And I think that would have screwed up Sunday's trolls. You would have identified them quickly and easily. I know. I, I, I was just a little bit distraught because the things they were saying. Uh, it was it was a pain. It, it was a pain. They were trying to be, they were trying to be, they were doing the demos to be unpleasant. They said something nice. The first comments were so, sounded semi intelligent. I, I pulled oh, up. Yeah. I mean, we're trying to say that. Uh, yeah. I think that the. Uh, what is it called? They were correcting uh, Ralph on some of the dates, which were incorrect. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that was very nasty. And then they kept coming back with different dates every time. Yeah, and then they got him seen and everything else. Yeah, well, the point is, n number one, you turn off the ability to rename, which makes it easier for you to keep track of them. When you turn somebody's video off, it stays off. They can't turn it back on again until you let them. And I think it's a pain to turn on. You can you can keep us from unmuting, and it's a pain to have to do that. But that's better than managing trolls. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I messed up. I didn't know what you know what to do. Well, I, you didn't. I mean, I basically I spent about two or three hours playing with my computers. I I had fun doing that. So. Oh no! Thank you. Thank and, you. And I wasn't under pressure. And I could make horrible mistakes. It's my own computer I'm screwing up. So. You don't want to experiment on that in a real meeting. I'm satisfied. You can turn off everybody's ability to turn the video on, but then it's a total mess. And you actually don't need, I, that's why I figured you actually don't need to do that. Right. All right, so, my yeah. brother, I will let you go. I hope okay. uh, you enjoy the rest of the day. I'll see you uh, Sunday, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. Bye, James. James, I'm glad you're back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In the in the winter, it's uh, easier schedule wise. By the way, I was thinking of have you um, <clears throat> on um, have you covered Caesar's Gallic Wars, in particular, Book not Five? Yet. Not where, yet. Not yet. We're yeah, gonna, we're gonna get to that. I,
that would be an interesting one for anybody who was of a certain age where we, where we all learned about uh, Caesar's conquests of yeah, or, or that his happens campaigns. After, it happens after Punic Wars. We're doing Punic Wars on Sunday. Well, again, mm -hmm. we'll talk a little bit about Gallic too. <laughs> yeah, uh, how we really divided the Brit British and the Weenies, the Weedies, and the Weekies. Weekies, correct. Well, we're, we're going to talk about it all. We're going to talk about Budica. We're going to talk about all that. Yeah, it's it's going to be really interesting. We we don't fought, we don't skip anything. We go very thoroughly with uh you know with uh kid gloves. You know we don't we don't really you know we don't skip anything. So you'll enjoy. Right. You know, hopefully uh, that will be fun. Yeah, I'm glad you're. I mean, I, I I know they don't teach it now. But I, when I was at school in England. I mean, Latin was compulsory, and so 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 was Caesar. <laughs> I would have, um, I would have made Hebrew compulsory. <laughs> well, then it was a, the only reason it was compulsory. Latin was compulsory, was because to get into the university you had to have Latin. That was abolished by the time I got to university age, but a uh, whole generation of us had been. Uh, Latin for, for years. Latin, Latinized. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, so listen, I'm, I'm really appreciate your back, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, we will uh, we'll do uh, Sunday login for the Punic War, first Punic War. Yeah. We, were, we had a ha hack attack last time, we couldn't do it, so. Now I realize, I'm sorry, I, in the summers it's a bit more difficult because I, I teach sailing. And, oh, um, nice. and that's... Uh, do you watch Olympics? No, I, I'm not a very good spectator, actually. Um, this one girl, she was uh, kayaking, and uh, she's like 15, and she won the gold gold Olympic. She's from Seattle. Uh -huh. Wow, she's amazing. She looks she looks very built. You know, <laughs> you got to be built because it's like a one woman kayaking. It's the first first time they had an Olympics. All right, All right. talk to you soon. Talk to you later. Talk to you later. Thanks.